Well, good evening, everyone. We're so glad you are here. I know this seems sort of silly that I'm speaking into a microphone, but I'm just letting you know we are recording this. And so it's going to be on our website for a resource. So we all need to speak into this for as, as we're chatting. But at the end, when we get to Q&A, we'll, we'll definitely make it more um, informal and not use the microphone. But welcome to our last of our series of April wellness series for the coalition. My name is Michelle McGrath and I'm the project coordinator for the Wanakee Community Cares Coalition. And we are excited to partner with the library and we have Amy in the back of the room. Um, we are partnering with the library to bring these events to our community and our coalition, like we've talked about before at our last events, but our coalition is dedicated to making Wanakee healthy and resilient. And we focus in a lot of the spaces with prevention, alcohol and drug prevention, as well as mental health. And throughout April, we have had speakers come in from around the country to work with our students, as well as give community um, seminars and, and workshops to our parents and our community members about specific topics around those, those things, prevention. And to this evening, we're talking more about the mental health as we, we get ready to get into the month of May, which is dedicated to it's Mental Health Awareness Month, is the month of May. So we're excited to bring you a, a great panel of presenters this evening around healthy minds, healthy bodies, and healthy hearts. We have I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about our presenters. They're going to talk a lot about that when they come up here. But we have Kim Flood, who is one of our coalition members, who um, is an expert in heart math. So she's going to explain a couple of things in that space, as well as how to curb anxiety and um, especially looking at mental health this upcoming month. And then we have John Weiss, who is with the Psychotherapy Center here in town. He is a counselor there, and he's going to share some things about mental health and mental wellness as well. And we have Marnie Walker, who is lots of things, but a nutritionist. And she, she's going to talk to you about healthy body, meditation, things to get your, your body and your um, you in balance. So, so without further ado, just a little bit about the protocol. Each of the presenters, I'm going to give them the mic, and then they have um, a presentation that'll be up behind me, and then I'll be advancing the slides for them. And then, like I said, we'll at the end of all three presenters is when we'll open it up for questions. So, all right, let's begin. So, without further ado, let's welcome Kim Flood and learn a little bit more about a healthy heart. Hello, this is gonna be a challenge, I think, for me to, to keep track of this um, microphone. So yes, I'm Kim Flood from Wisdom and Wellness. And so um, I am gonna talk about heart math today, but I also work in mental health and I do, I do individual sessions with folks and I meet them um, wherever they're at and just talk about whatever stress is showing up for you and dig into different modalities of how to help you feel better. So that's what I'm all about is helping reduce stress and building resilience. And so what I'm gonna to try to talk about in 15 minutes is heart math and just give you a little taste of that um, because it's, it's, a, it's a modality that I use personally and that can really help you because it's a, um, it's a tool that you can use anywhere and anytime on the go, which is um, incredible. You don't have to go to an office to do it. You can just do it while you're driving on the Beltline in Madison or on the interstate or wherever, and it will help you calm your nervous system down. So I'm gonna talk about that today. So you can go ahead and click through it. So how many, has anybody heard of heart math before? I figured probably some of you guys have heard. Okay, um, it's, um, it's been around for about 27 years and there's a lot of published research as you can see. Um, so if you're interested in, in learning more about it, you can go to heartmath.com or just type in the Heart Math Institute. Um, it's H-E-A-R-T-M-A-T-H, -E -A -A heart math is um, how it's spelled but it's been around for a very long time and a lot of people have not heard of it, but it's, it's incredible. So, um, so what, I, what I'd like to explain is um, just what's, what, why the heart is such a powerhouse and why it's called heart math. Because when we, we talk a lot about, what I do with sessions is talk a lot about feelings. What are we feeling, okay? Because whatever we're feeling in our heart is gonna make a big difference in our behavior and how we move through our day. 
So some science behind the heart mass modality is what I'm gonna talk about now, the physiology between the heart and the brain. So when we feel a feeling, um, we either feel positive feelings or we feel negative feelings, right? So in heart math, we call it renewing emotions, the positive feelings, and then depleting emotions, which are the negative um, feelings. So when you feel a feeling, your heart will send a message to your brain and it will tell the brain, the hypothalamus, which is the um, part of our brain, the emotional part of our brain, and it'll, um, the hypothalamus's job is to secrete hormones that regulate our nervous system, okay? So the heart has its own complex neurological system. And what, what we learned is that it sends 80% more messages to our brain than our brain sends to our body. So we need to be paying attention to what's going on in our heart, okay? And the heart, um, the patterns in the neural signals, like I said, when we feel a feeling um, from the heart, especially affect the brain centers involved in our perception, our emotional experience and self-regulation. So if we feel um, a positive emotion, a renewing emotion, an, an renewing emotion, such as love or joy or peace, or we're calm, our heart's gonna send a message to the hypothalamus to secrete feel-good hormones. And feel-good hormones that we talk about are dopamine, serotonin, DHEA. Those hormones will calm our nervous system down really nicely. And then we have more ability to walk through whatever comes at us. If we're feeling a negative emotion, such as um, anger, fear, confusion, unpredictability, which is what we've been feeling for the last three years and still, right? When we have those emotions rumbling, our heart sends a message to our brain to secrete the stress hormone. Does anybody know what the stress hormone is? Cortisol, I figured one of you guys would know. Cortisol, okay? That's the stress hormone. So if we're feeling a depleting emotion, it's not good. And our, our uh, hypothalamus is gonna secrete that cortisol. And when we have cortisol running through our body, it's not a good scene, especially if we have a lot of it. Now we need cortisol. We have, that's the hormone that wakes us up every single morning. So we have to have it. But if we have too much cortisol running around because we're feeling fear and unpredictability and confusion and anger or whatever, um, then we start to have all kinds of things show up. It, it, it affects our digestion. It affects our immune system. It affects our ability to think clearly and be rational and logical. So if you have a bunch of um, negative emotions coming at you all the time, you're kind of not calm, but you're sort of bumping up and not feeling as good. And pretty soon you might be up here a lot of the time sort of walking on eggshells because there's just so many things coming at you. There might be one more point where you're feeling that last negative emotion and boom, your prefrontal cortex right here, the, the front, front lobe is going to shut down because it's got so much cortisol. It sort of floods that area. And this is the area where we make decisions. This is where we're, we have the ability to be rational and logical. So when we have so much cortisol running around in our, in our body, that might just be that one more thing. And then we're, we're like yelling, screaming, hitting, running away. It's a fight or flight response, if you've ever heard of that. So we don't, we don't like that because that's not a good place to be. It doesn't feel good. It takes a long time to recover from that. And, and it affects our relationships and, and everything because we can't make good decisions. Um, so I already talked about the depleting emotions such as fear, frustration, impatience. Um, and again, when we have a lot of that, we have the toxic feeling and causes the re release of the stress hormone, cortisol. And we see all of these things occurring in our body and it's, it's not a good thing to have. And so what I try to do with people is help you feel, figure out what are, what are you feeling? We don't do a good job in our culture, in our society of talking about how we feel. I ask this question all the time and even to myself. And it's like, what am I feeling? If we can start talking about feelings then we can start to address what's going on and notice where we're at and, and do something about it, right? But we really don't do, um, do that very often. So I talk a lot about that in my sessions. We talk about the pleading emotions. We talk about the renewing emotions, which should be the next slide. Um, emotions and attitude, care, courage, tolerance, appreciation, create the neurochemicals that regenerate your system and offset the energy drain of the um, depleting emotions. 
when you have that happening, you're going to have increased longevity, increased resilience to adversity, improved memory, improved problem solving, increased intuition and creativity, and improved job performance and achievement. And who doesn't want that? Okay. So when, um, so when you're working on heart math or where you're working with me, I talk about all these things, we identify emotions, and then I use some tools and the next slide should be a, a tool that I use with people to try to help you identify where you live most of the time. When you're feeling negative emotions, depleting emotions, you're living on this side of this grid and you're secreting cortisol a lot of the time. Um, it affects your, your nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system is when you have a really high heart rate and you're kind of up here and just on guard and walking on eggshells a lot of time. Um, and then if you have the renewing emotions and you're producing DHEA, dopamine or serotonin, you're living on the other side of the grid. And you have uh, more of a, you're more in the parasympathetic state where you're calm, cool, and collected and have that resilience to keep going. So I work with people on identifying where do you, where are you most of the time? What are you feeling most of the time? And then we start to try to shift you in a different, into a different quadrant so that you're feeling better. If you're, if you're living maybe in the danger zone up here where you're feeling a lot of frustration and confusion and fear and anger. And again, what are we living in? I mean, all the time, but people just kind of keep going through it, right? And they don't really pay attention to what's going on and then they're not feeling good, right? And then all these other things start showing up and then it becomes this vicious cycle. So I try to help people name what they're feeling so that they can tame it. There's a famous child psychologist, Dan Segal, who coined that phrase, name it to tame it. There's so much power in that. I just used it today in three sessions. It's like, let's just name it. So then we can do something about it. But if you don't talk about what you're feeling, you really can't do it much about it. You're just feeling terrible, right? Okay. Um, so another word that we use in heart math is the term coherence. And that's the optimal state of functioning. Um, and so when you're feeling really good, positive, renewing emotions, you can get yourself to shift into a state of coherence. And I'm going to show you some technology that we use in heart math that actually can show you in real time that you can shift out of a state of stress and into a state of coherence. So the definition is that it's an optimal state in which the heart and the mind and the emotions are aligned and in sync, kind of like that, wah, like zen, zen place, right? Physiologically, when you're in coherence, your immune system, your hormonal system, and your nervous systems function in a state of energetic coordination. And that's where you want to be because then again, you have more resilience to tolerate whatever's coming next. When you turn the TV on, what are you going to hear? You drive down the road, what are you going to see? Go to school, what, you know, all the things. Okay. Okay. So the, the really cool thing about heart math is there's techniques that we use to help you um, tune into your heart and shift out of a state of stress and into a state of coherence. And we use some technology that I'm going to actually have somebody plug into right now so that you can see it in real time how it works. So I think Jody's going to be the volunteer guinea pig for me. Um, you might, yeah, you probably need a chair. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this piece of it. This is the cool part. So what, you're, what, what we need to do is have you put this sensor on your ear. And what it's gonna do is it's going to measure your heart rate variability, which is just groups of heartbeats all smushed together. So we've gotta make sure that she has a pulse here. So I'm gonna do a couple things at once. So it's always the first step. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I, uh, I use these in my sessions and I'm gonna teach you a technique here in a second, but I just wanna get this technology going so that you can sort of see the magic happening at the same time. So we're waiting to see if she has a pulse quick. So I like, I think it's really cool to be able to get this feedback in real time because a lot of times we walk around, we've been trained to just say, I'm fine, I'm fine. Everything's okay, I can, I can manage, right? when we're really not fine. So this is a way to really see where you're at um, because it doesn't lie. And this technology picks up on the nervous system. It's measuring what's going on in your nervous system. And I can't get a pulse, <laughs> sorry, a little. 
My earlobe's not big enough. <laughs> Do you have earrings in? No. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, now it looks like it might be going. Okay, so this is going to show me as a trainer. Um, I'm a licensed heart math trainer, so it's going to show me the state that her nervous system is in. And then by using the heart math techniques, we are if it's in a state of stress, we're able to help her shift out of that. So this up here, this slide shows what you're going to see on the screen if you, yep, you got to pull. Okay. So when you're in incoherence up here, when you're feeling those depleting emotions, such as frustration, irritation, impatience, worry, your um, heart rate variability printout on the screen is going to look like this side. It's going to be pretty chaotic. See, it's all over the place. And what that, what that is, is your, your um, sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system sort of fighting against each other. You want to be calm, but you can't because you've got too much cortisol floating around in your body because you're feeling those emotions in that way. When you're in that state, it inhibits your brain function, it impairs your performance and all those other things that we saw happening before. Okay, good. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second because you probably can't see it anyway. Um, yep. Well, I'm gonna point something out really quick because this is exactly what I wanted you to see. So she was, she was not, um, I wasn't looking at her and I wasn't paying attention to her. So she was just kind of doing good. And so she was, there's um, these little bars here. This green is in that coherent state and the red is stress, okay? So while she was sitting here and I was talking, she wasn't, you know, she was just in the green a little bit. And then the minute I looked over here, she went, boom, down into the stress cell state. So you must've been feeling some sort of something when I maybe like, oh, whoa, you know? Um, and so that's how sensitive it is. That's the reason I'm pointing it out because it's so, so sensitive. It really captures everything that's going on in your nervous system at any moment. So that's, that's the cool part because it doesn't lie, all right? So when you're in the coherent state and you're feeling things such as appreciation, calm, patient, confidence, this is what the, um, the printout's gonna be. And up here, I don't think you can see it. It shows me in this part, it's showing me one of these two things. And when you're coherent, you can see the difference, right? You're nice and smooth and everything is running really, really nicely. And that, that means your, your, um, your nervous system is in sync and you have that resilience to keep going. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, so, can you see, anybody see this? You can see it? Okay. So that's what the technology looks like. Well, you were way up into the, she was feeling really good while I was talking and yeah, yeah, you're looking good. Okay. <laughs> that's good, that's good. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna teach you guys a technique for heart math. There's about seven different techniques that we use for different different reasons. Um, the, the foundational technique is called heart focused breathing. And it's so simple, it's ridiculous, but it's super, super powerful. And every other technique in heart math builds off of that one. So all it is, and we'll do it together because I really want to see what, what um, goes on with you. Um, it's just focusing all of your energy on the area of your heart. Okay, because again, the heart is the powerhouse. We need to focus in there because taking, um, if you focus there, you're taking energy away from your mind and all your thoughts and all your worries or whatever's going on there. And you're taking energy away from your body. So if you have any aches or pains or you're hungry or whatever, um, you're taking energy away from that. So just by focusing on the heart, you can shift and start shifting into an optimal state. And then we want to focus on um, breathing through our heart, which is kind of a hard concept. But I think about um, like our blood flowing through the heart, right? Just imagine that your breath is flowing through your heart. And the whole reason behind that is just to stay focused on the heart area. And then, and then start breathing a little bit slower and a little bit deeper than usual. So why don't we, because you can, you can do this for one minute anywhere, anytime. And you can literally, if you're in a stressed out state, I do this all the time when I'm driving, I focus on my heart and imagine my breath flowing through my heart and breathe a little bit deeper. And then I can shift back up to that green place. Once you get up here to the green and you're in that coherent state, you want to be able to sustain that as long as possible. So it takes some time. And that's what I work with people in sessions on is just doing that. 
So um, you're already in the green. You're liking what I'm saying. So that's really good. You can see she's, she's doing really good here. However, if you can see her printout up here is still a little bit like, well, okay, that's okay, that's okay. It's, it's like that once the other side where it's a little bit fighting against each other, which is, is pretty typical too. So why don't we just take one minute, I probably just have one minute left, and we can just do that heart focused breathing technique together just to see what it feels like. I know it just for one minute, but I think it's pretty cool and powerful. So you just close your eyes and focus all of your attention on the air of your heart. Imagine your breath flowing in and out. Just stay focused on your heart area and then breathe a little bit deeper, a little bit slower than usual. Just stay focused on your heart. Oh, okay. That's the heart focused breathing technique. It's so simple. And again, you can do, you don't have to close your eyes when you're driving and I don't believe me, I don't. But if I'm at a stop sign, sometimes I do. Um, so I help people um, practice this technique and, and really, I don't know if anybody, if anybody noticed the shift in just one minute, a minute is very short amount of time, but you, you might've felt like something release. Um, I help people identify where in your body are you holding your stress? because most people don't know. And if you start to, to learn about that, then you can, then you can catch it sooner that rather than holding on to your, you know, your tight shoulders all day and you're walking around like this, if you start to practice this, you, you're like, oh, I can relax. I can do something about that. So that, um, that is really powerful. So whoop, screen went up here. I was just going to peek at you. Oh my gosh. If you could see what happened to her readout up here, can you see that? That's exactly what I'm talking about. So when I said before, it was kind of like all over the place. Now, I don't know if you want to look at it, Jody, but look at how smooth it is right there. Um, and pass. You pass. <laughs> Way to go. Good job. Thanks for being a guinea pig. So that's, um, that's what I wanted to share today is the modality of heart math. And so I'm, I'll take any questions later on when, when we're ready. Okay, cool. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. So I am John Weiss. Can you hear me okay back there? So, um, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about the idea of vulnerability. I've been uh, on kind of a Brene Brown kick. I don't know if any of you know Brene Brown, but it's, um, she just seems to find her way to me. Um, I'm gonna start out by just saying, um, a colleague and I opened the Psychotherapy Center of Wanakee um, Melissa Olson and I, um, we signed our documents to open the clinic on February 20th of 2020. And so we're, we were primarily expected to go into the schools. So we were really excited. We had both worked at Oregon Mental Health Services before that. And then, um, then they were started talking a couple of weeks later about this virus going around. It's like, okay, well, we'll have to keep our eye out for that. So, um, so the idea of vulnerability has been kind of with us from the start of our, our clinic. Um, I, we went to grad school together as well. Melissa and I did, we went to Edgewood. Uh, uh, we're both licensed marriage and family therapists. One of the things they talked about in grad school was as a therapist, you have to be really cognizant of your biases, your own biases. So um, I try to check those as much as I can, but I tell my clients I have one bias that I cannot get rid of. And then I realize I do by choice, I won't. Um, there's a, one of the foundational um, 
characters in, in psychology was a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Carl Rogers. And he, he was a psychotherapist. And he had a phrase that when he worked with his clients, he had unconditional positive regard for all of his clients. And I really, that, that resonated with me that I, I really want, the goal around this is wanting the best. And so there's a, an even better phrase that I stole from Dr. Jordan Peterson. And he said, um, I love this phrase, I'm aligned with the part of you that wants the best for you. So I'm convinced there's a part that we all have that wants the best for ourselves. We don't often listen to it. Um, sometimes we ignore it. Sometimes we say, well, it's selfish to go that way. I need to take care of this person and this person. So I'm really encouraging around the idea of tapping into that part of you that wants the best for you. So how does that happen? Well, it's about getting really clear about what you want. And then after getting really clear about what you want, and I don't mean to gloss over that because what I do often with clients is actually have them journal around that and then journal more around that to get really clear about what you want. Um, and then to take action. So the action step is often the most difficult part. We might get clear about what we want. We might get insight and understanding, but taking that action step. And by action step, I don't mean reading a book. I mean, literal action step. And usually that involves interacting with someone else. So I, I don't have simple down yet. I, I, need, to, I need to get simple down and I, I'm kind of a visual learner. And so as I was working with clients, particular, particularly parents who were trying to uh, work with their kiddos or couples uh, in particular, there was this idea of the importance of emotional connection, establishing an emotional connection with your child, nurturing that emotional connection. And then with couples, either strengthening it or rebuilding that connection. And I kept coming back to this idea of taking an action step and finding that some clients would take that action step very early and there was progress and movement and excitement and, and then others who really struggled around this. So I, I came up with this metaphor of the bridge of vulnerability. And it's really a kind of building off of Brene Brown who's done a lot of work on shame and vulnerability and she has a TED talk on vulnerability. Have any of you seen that? Um, you're one of 35 million who have seen it. It's the fifth most watched TED talk. So to me, it was, there must be something to this. There must be something resonating. And what I noticed with my clients is this, this resonated and I was just kind of made up and I kind of added to it and would check in. And then, then they would start repeating it back to me in, in subsequent sessions. You know that bridge you talk about? Well, I tried to go to the middle of the bridge, but he wouldn't. It's like, you remember the bridge? Wow, wow. okay, there's something there. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this bridge of vulnerability um, as a way towards that best self. So I'm gonna steal a line from the, the previous slides. I love the idea of coherence. I just the fact that we can experience love and peace and joy and contentment. We can experience those. I, I say sometimes to my clients, you can experience the joy of a sunset. We've all probably done that. Why? Why are we able to experience that? Where does that come from? I don't really know. I just know that we can. Well, if we can, and we can experience that, why should it be like a one-off or like every once in a while or when good things happen to us? Then I feel great, really. So I'm gonna rely on the external, the world going my way in order to feel good. What if you didn't have to rely on the external? What if there was a path that you could rely on regardless of what happens externally? It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of practice, but it's possible. So if it's possible, what if you really committed to that process? So 
I'm going to just share the bridge of vulnerability for a moment. Now, I don't know about you, but when I am driving and I go over a bridge, there's a little moment of like, we good? Um, and I have a seven-year-old son and he's like, hey, dad, are we safe on this bridge? And I'm like, oh boy, uh, yeah, yeah, we're good. And you think, well, why are we good? Well, you put your trust and faith in the people that built it, maintain it, take care of it. Uh, but there's always a little bit of unease on a bridge for me. So then I wonder, well, where am I most uneasy on the bridge? Well, it's halfway across the bridge. Like, well, I'm as far away from both sides. So to me, the place of vulnerability, being most vulnerable, is in the center. So that kind of resonated with me about being most vulnerable. What, what do we mean by most vulnerable or even vulnerability? So Brene Brown talks about it as the willingness to take a courageous act to show our true selves without knowing what the outcome is. So she talks about the first one, an act of vulnerability is saying, I love you and not knowing if you're gonna get it back. So I become convinced that the, the center of that bridge is where all the good stuff is. It's where all the connection is. It's where all the creativity is. It's where all the joy is. So what does that mean? It means I'm going to take action that I want, that I know for myself is good for me and the other person without knowing I'm gonna get anything in return. So I wanted to give you an example of that. I said, if, you know, if I'm gonna believe this, then I better act it out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. So um, I had a really good friend, my best friend from high school. Um, we're still really good friends. Um, his wife was diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer while she was pregnant with their second child. And so um, she had the baby and had chemotherapy. And when the child was about six months old, she passed away. So I experienced this, this whole process with him. And uh, it was difficult and, there and, and, and impossible and, and painful. And about a month or two after she passed away, we were having a conversation and I, I just felt so strongly for my friend. Um, you know, we're both sports guys and we've been friends. We played Little League together and grew up together. And uh, I told him that I loved him. And there was this long pause. And I realized at that moment, I don't care what you say. I, I don't need it back. I just want you to know, for me, I want you to know. Well, there was nothing in return. That's okay. I wanted you to know. So about six months after that occasion, um, I got an email. It was a long email. And it was all about how he wanted to express how he loved me. He couldn't, it was a little too much for him to say it in the moment. Um, but I'm so thankful that I did that because I got that back. But more importantly, I, I knew that he knew. Now, it's a general generalization, which means it's true more often than not, that the idea of going into vulnerability is harder for men. Um, and that, so, so as, a, as a therapist who is trying to teach vulnerability, it's important to live it out. So I, um, I am looking for it all the time, probably too many times, but I'm looking for it all the time. So what is that like? Um, it's a challenge and it's scary and it takes courage, but it's where all the good stuff is. So stepping onto the bridge takes courage. Why, why does it take courage? Because as I step onto the bridge and I move into that place in the middle of the bridge, and I'm going to express how I feel or I'm gonna act out how I feel, there is a chance, and sometimes a great chance, that I'm going to be judged or criticized or looked at funny as I'm in the middle of the bridge. Well, what, 
what does that feel like? Well, it's never fun to be judged and criticized, but especially if you are in a open, vulnerable place. So it does take courage that not knowing how this is going to, uh, the outcome of it, I'm going to choose to do it anyway. Um, as I mentioned, I'm kind of a sports fan. So I once heard um, Herb Brooks. Does anybody know who Herb Brooks is? Herb Brooks is the, the coach of the 1980 uh, hockey team, the U.S. hockey team, the miracle hockey team that won the gold medal. So when he was talking to his team about who was trying out, he talked about the, he used the phrase to sacrifice for the unknown, that I'm going to give everything I have, but I don't know if I'm going to make the team. You have to be willing to sacrifice for the unknown. We've kind of lost that. The idea is I'm only going to give as much as I can if I know the outcome. I'm only going to say I'm sorry if I know that I'm going to get it back. I'm only going to say I love you if I know I'm going to get it back. Because if I were to say it and I don't give it back, whoa, I'm kind of out in the middle of the bridge. So it takes a lot of courage to do that part. So I'm going to connect with the next one. So here she is in the middle of the bridge and uh, exposed. And why do I say it's where all the good stuff is? So the idea is I'm going to express to that person, child, spouse, friend, how I feel about them, what I, what I would like from them, um, what's important to me, what I want. And the person, if you can imagine, and I do this with my clients, so I'm just going to separate from the microphone for a second. We're each on this end, and I go to the middle, and the other person is on this end, and then you're waiting. And what could this other person do? They could walk away, and I'm left in the middle of the bridge. Yep, that could happen. The idea is if they join me in the middle and they share their vulnerability, their honesty, their true self, that is where the connection rings true. I'm not going to judge you. You're not going to judge me. We know we have flaws. And when I've seen that happen, it's, it's kind of a miracle. So when I've seen a son and a mom a high school son and a mom who haven't talked to each other for six months. And then one starts to take that step to the middle of the bridge. And it could be either one. And when they both sob in each other's arms and they both express their sorrow, I get a front row seat for that, which is why I love my job. Now, that just looking at that kind of makes me uncomfortable. Um, so the idea around this is that as I come to the middle of the bridge, regardless of what happens, regardless of if the other person joins me, I'm safe. I can handle this. And that's true. What I have found more often than not is that we dramatically underestimate how strong we are. It's not always comfortable. Oftentimes it's awkward and hard. But I used to coach varsity basketball for 20 years and I would tell my players you get good at what you practice and that's true that's that's a truism for being a human being we get better at what we're practice we might not get good but we get better so the idea of coming to the middle of that bridge and getting comfortable with that place that I'm going to extend my kindness and love to someone without knowing what I'm going to get in return and then getting comfortable there I think that's, uh, that's a worthy practice. I think, I, I think that's the last one, right? Um, the idea of, of doing that is unique for each person. So my encouragement for tonight, your assignment, is to consider who you want to do that with and then take that chance to go to the middle of the bridge. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. So that's hard to follow up. <laughs> Holy moly. Um, so a lot about, I'm going to introduce myself first, and then I'm going to take a couple notes from pages from what they both said, because it all rolls together. But my name is Marnie Walker, and I have a health coaching business. I'm certified um, from the Institute of Integrated Nutrition, and um, also a 200-hour uh, yoga instructor. And I've gotten a lot of added on certifications after that through wisdoms training in Ayurvedic um, and uh, a little bit of psychology, which is not professional, but through certification. And I um, own my own health coaching business. I also am co-founding um, a retreat business with Michelle McGrath. So there's a lot of space that we actually cover that is sort of enveloping all of what you have both said. And um, although I'm going to talk about nutrition tonight specifically, all of these pieces are a part of what is super important at um, holistic health and wellness and self-love and coherence or flow, whatever you want to call it, right? So um, I'm going to go to the next slide and start because otherwise I'm going to get really deep into all of that. <laughs> so I coach around primary food and primary food is similar to what um, both of these lovely souls have talked about, which is taking into consideration everything that affects you. It is not just nutrition. When people come to me about nutrition, it's usually because there's a lot of other things going on and that's how it shows up. Like, why can't I get better? Why can't I eat better? Why can't I overcome these blocks? It's usually because of stuff down core beliefs and things that we can't get over. Um, emotional blocks, the lack of being um, vulnerable or not loving ourselves enough. And so a lot of these things are things that need to be uncovered first. And then we sort of dip into whatever is the top priority for um, them at that time. And it's just a little bit of chipping at a time. So if it's nutrition, we'll work on that and just give the education. But um, these are all areas that I look at with clients. So relationships, social life, your joy, created creativity, education, uh, the, any of these categories could be a place where someone could feel like they're just not feeling complete, or there's a little bit of something that they wish was different. Um, and so we start here because even though they might be coming with, I just, I want to lose 20 pounds or whatever it happens to be, it's usually connected to something else in a different category. And then I have them kind of circle, where are we starting? Like, what are, what are the areas that you really want to look at? Um, and that's a typical kind of health coaching session. So this is what I do first kind of look at things like, are you cooking at home? You know, if not, why? How are you eating now if that's the primary concern? Um, and what's your home environment or whatever? Because that's definitely going to affect how things are with you. Um, it could be stressful. And so if it's stressful, then we're probably not making good choices. Um, let me go to the next one. So as a health coach, if I'm coaching around nutrition and we're specifically working on that, I go to crowding out. And the reason that I do this is because I don't like to speak to people about what you shouldn't be doing. I would prefer to talk to people about what can you do? Um, what are some positive things that you can do to move in the right direction? From a nutritional standpoint, I talk about adding things in instead of subtracting things. So greens, whole grains, legumes, water, high fiber fruits, if you start putting more of these in your diet, you naturally will start eating less of all the other stuff. And that just happens organically because you're getting more satiety, you're getting more nutrition, you're getting the things that your body needs and suddenly you don't really need that stuff at the end of the day or whenever it is, or I, I might be more calm or centered. So if stress is causing it, then I don't need to go to the sugar or the processed things because I'm feeling better. I'm more energetic. I'm calmer. Um, but it also, I want to mention, and um, I think both of uh, John and Kim mentioned this as well, this is a, not an overnight process. So nothing is. We are all on a super long journey of life and everything that you do is baby steps in the right direction. And um, that is a huge part of understanding how to move forward because the minute you think, 
oh, yesterday was bad, or I, you know, two days in a row were bad, or a week, it, it doesn't really matter, there's no bad, there's just like, what can I do a little bit better each day? And um, we talk about this a lot, I, there's an author I love, James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits, and Atomic Habits is a great book that you can apply the concepts to just about anything, it's like 1% better, right? And all the people who have done great things, just do a little bit more each day in the right direction and they get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better and suddenly there's greatness. It doesn't happen overnight, even though we think it does, it, it doesn't. So um, crowding out is a great way to look at um, nutrition because rather than thinking of what you can't have, just think, how can I add things in? Could I put some more greens in my life today? Can I put them in a smoothie in the morning or have a salad at lunch? Even alongside your meal, eat it first, right? So um, it's just a way to get more nutrition in, feel better um, and feel a little bit more full because of the fiber that's in those, those foods. This I'm just putting up because um, I'm such a big advocate of greens. I mean, just throw them into everything. You're gonna, it's fiber, there's so much nutrition. And here's just a short list of what greens do for you. Blood purification, cancer prevention, circulation, immune strengthening. Um, it reduces, why I put lifted spirit and reduced anxiety and depression is because when you're feeling lighter and better, you feel lighter and better. You don't have that heavy, you know, oh gosh, you know, low energy, can't do anything. Um, promotion of intestinal flora, healthy intestinal flora, and liver, gallbladder, kidney function. This is all just benefits from greens. So like, why wouldn't you? You, <laughs> you can't even taste spinach in your smoothie. So you might as well just throw it in there, right? Um, there's lots of ways to get them in, even if you don't love them. I actually was at the chiropractor today and there was a um, a patient on the table next to me getting an adjustment. And she was saying that her cardiologist told her to exclude greens <laughs> and my chiropractor about fell on the floor. So, I mean, I don't know who says that. <laughs> Add them in. Next slide, sorry. Um, so, and then these are things to think about reducing, but there's never a just don't. These things happen a little bit at a time. So, Reducing meat, you can have it for sure. And if you love meat, eat it, but source it well. Um, you know, it should be organic, um, family farmed if possible. This is getting so much easier, by the way. I mean, I'm sure you all know this, but like getting local um, meat, um, reducing dairy and lac uh, lactose, which basically is the sugar um, in dairy. And a lot of people have issues with that and don't even know they had it or have it until they take it out. So, um, there's lactase is actually the enzyme that causes you to have um, intestinal upset when you eat dairy. And I know like my daughter has it and doesn't, she didn't even really realize it until she stopped eating it and she felt so much better. So sugar is kind of an obvious one. I think most people know, but processed and artificial food, alcohol and gluten. Gluten is one that, um, you know, a lot of us hear about celiac disease, that's an extreme end of, of gluten causing problems, but gluten can cause a lot of problems for everybody and most people don't realize it. Um, it can cause small problems that it messes with your intestinal lining and you, you probably don't even realize that that's what it's tied to. So reducing gluten is a great way to just see if you can immediately feel a little bit better. Um, and it's pretty easy now with labels to understand where gluten hides. Um, most people are, or most companies are even labeling gluten-free now. So, um, and then consider, um, I always talk to clients about just doing things. And the, the reason I'm trickling this in is because again, the little things matter. The little things that you do every day really, really do add up. So if you develop easy and reliable habits to nurture your, your body, like things you do every day, there's lots of stuff like drinking hot water in the morning instead of a cup of coffee. I mean, I, I love coffee, so I'm not gonna put down coffee, but um, it really is great for like getting bowels moving and just feeling a little bit better and it works. So those, those are just little things, little habits you can kind of hide away into your day, surrounding yourself with healthy relationships that are supportive. And this is a big one and we could, a lot of these things and everything that these two lovely people talked about, we could go really deep into because it all sort of um, uh, the bottom of it or the core of it is about like supporting yourself and self-love and being intuitive about what's right for you. Um, 
so, but doing, doing little things every day. Um, if you don't feel good, take a walk, um, commit to it regularly. And you're going to start to feel a little bit better every single day. Um, find time for quiet and meditation. And um, Kim was talking about um, heart math with the breathing exercises. And that is definitely a meditation. I mean, however, whatever you want to call it, but um, breathing calms the nervous system. And so when you um, sit quietly, you get into a coherence or flow if you breathe properly and you just take the time. And um, I'll give a short story, but my daughter who is 21 and <laughs> had a interview for an internship today was freaking out. I mean, she was freaking out. And she was calling me like for the last three days about, I'm so stressed, I'm so stressed, I'm so nervous, you know? And I just said, well, you know, take, just take a couple minutes, take a walk, take some deep breaths. And honestly, she called me today before it and said, I feel so much better. I'm like, so ready. And I'm like, yeah, just breathe. <laughs> like, it seems simple, but literally the breathing. Um, and then sleeping, obviously, and, and again, listening to your intuition, but it's, it's pretty big deal. Um, that, that is a big heart thing too. Like, if you can just take the time to listen to yourself, you know the right things. Nobody really has to tell you you're supposed to eat spinach, you know, like, you know that. So like, it's hard because we're trying to please a lot of other people and we're all walking around feeling laden with other things, whether it's societal things or things in our families, but really it's just about listening to yourself, like what's good for me right now. And that's, that shouldn't be a guilty pleasure because if you fill yourself up, you're really so much better at filling other people up for sure. I have one minute. So um, one other thing I coach on a lot when it comes to nutrition is bioindividuality. And um, this is important because nobody's the same. So that's why one diet doesn't fit all. Our ancestry is different. Our metabolisms, metabolisms are different, our blood types. And we should all be intuitively eating. If red meat doesn't feel good to you, you shouldn't eat red meat, you know, eat some more fish. <laughs> but anyway, so next slide. Um, I, again, uh, am a health coach and these are my sort of credentials, but I appreciate being here. And if anyone has any questions, let me know. Thanks, Marty. And thanks to all of our presenters. That was fantastic. Just a, we'll do a quick little conclusion for our folks that are going to be watching this virtually, and then we'll open it up for Q and A in a second. But I think they definitely brought it home tonight, talking about how to keep ourselves healthy and resilient. What we want to do with the community as as a coalition, we work with a lot of business partners throughout the community, and really focus on these things. One of the things that <clears throat> we've been sharing, if you look into the news, that the number one reason people are losing their lives right now. The first one is fentanyl poisoning. The second one is depression <clears throat> and suicide. And the third is COVID. But yet we always hear about COVID on the news. And yet we don't hear about the other two. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's why we, as a coalition, wanted to make sure we brought these messages to the community. Um, the last two weeks have been focusing on prevention and looking at fentanyl poisoning and things that are affecting our young people. And it was so exciting tonight to hear some positive things about what you can do for your mental health and your nutrition and your heart to make sure that you're living a positive life and one that's, that is definitely gonna keep you healthy and resilient. So I, we have a couple of people from the coalition here that I'm super excited that joined us. Maddie in the back, she is our intern who does a fabulous job with our social media. So if you haven't joined us on social media, you definitely need to. And if you go over to the little um, brochure that's flipped up over there, you can take a picture of the little um, scan me and it'll take you to our resource page and to all the things that we have there. And we have Jody over here as well, who is our chair of our board who's worked tirelessly for the past four or five years on coalition work to bring this great work to you. So we are excited to bring these events to you. And now we will actually end the recording and then we'll open it up for a couple quick questions. I know the library closes soon, so we only have a couple minutes, but let, if you could please